Man had been using powder rockets as war weapons for centuries, with no idea that the principle of reaction, the only one capable of working in a vacuum, would one day enable them to reach the cosmos. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century that scientists, spurred on by growing public interest in space travel and science fiction novels, finally became interested in the technical means of blasting away from the Earth's attraction. In 1883, the Russian rocket scientist Konstantin Cholkovsky took a rational approach to the issue and established a theory on the principles of rocket propulsion, advocating the use of liquid propellants. In the early 20th century, the German physicist Hermann Oberth further developed Cholkovsky's work and started experimenting. Around the same time, the American scientist Robert Goddard was also experimenting with liquid propulsion, and in March 1926, he succeeded in launching the first rocket with a liquid-fueled engine. But the beginnings of space in activity in Europe came about under the impetus of the military. When Germany rearmed in the early 30s, it had to observe the restrictions on offensive weapons set out in the Treaty of Versailles. On its quest for new weapons, the military took an active interest in some experiments being carried out by groups of young engineers, modelled on Hermann Oberth. They viewed these experiments as an opportunity to get round the restrictions of the treaty. Recruiting some of the engineers, they gave them the task under Werner von Braun of creating a rocket that could transport a tonne of explosives 300 kilometres. This was much further and much more powerful than any existing weapon of the time. The scientists and engineers were able to take advantage of huge financial, human and logistical means, and their work ended in the successful launch of the first V-2 rocket in October 1942 at Pinamund. Used in military operations from September 1944 on Paris, London and Antwerp, the V-2 became the first ballistic missile. It arrived too late, however, to change the course of the war. The creation of this huge rocket represented a real technological breakthrough. It was a complex system, propelled by a liquid-fueled rocket engine, driven by a turbo pump. Its development was the fruit of much research in such diverse fields as propulsion, chemistry, metallurgy and radio control. The V-2, thousands of which were built in the space of a few months, was an industrial feat, attained at the price of thousands of deportees. At the end of the war, the Allied forces became interested in the technical progress carried out by Nazi Germany. In the context of the arms race, the Soviets, Americans, English and French used German savoir-faire, technicians and engineers, to start building their own rockets. In the throes of the Cold War, and once the issue of space had become an area of confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States, the international community fixed the objective in the framework of the International Geophysical Year in 1957 to also use space as a means for scientific research. France, which benefited from the technical contribution of the V2 to develop its Véronique probe rocket, was slow to take part. This development was due to a policy of national independence led from 1958 by General de Gaulle based on the strength of nuclear strategy as a deterrent with the famous Mirage 4 and ballistic missiles. With the liftoff of the satellite launcher Diamant from the Amaguia launch site in Algeria on the 26th of November 1965, which sent the A1 capsule into orbit, France became the third space power. In addition to the many issues of sovereignty it involves, Mastering space technology and accessibility provides great scope for major international civil programs to benefit both the scientific community and each and every citizen.